Everybody, welcome to La Lista a Latinx Writers Podcast. I am your host, Ruben Mendive, and I welcome to a whole new episode. Um, we always start off with my guests introducing themselves. So who you are, how you identify, just so the listeners can sort of start to get to know who you are. Yeah, my name is Gabriela Tagrevini. I'm a writer director. I was born in Argentina, but I've been living in Los Angeles for 20 years. All right, perfect. Um, so yeah, that's sort of goes into my first question. I always ask people, where are they from, where they grew up? So if you want to talk about that. I, I grew up in Buenos Aires. Uh, I had a very happy childhood. Uh, I would write. Uh, I knew how to tell stories before I knew how to write. I would dictate stories to my mother, and she would write them down because I didn't know how to write, but I knew how to tell stories with uh, beginning, middle, and end. Uh, sometimes they were random, but she saved them. Um, yeah. So I knew I wanted to be a writer before I knew how to write. And and sort of what stories were you telling then? At that point, I think I just, I, it was about princess marrying a car. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just say that one. Yeah. It's funny. You know, classic story. Yeah, it was, it's, it's funny when I see it because it's, uh, it's, I think, it is not marrying a man, it's marrying some sort of powerful thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it had a lot of colors, you know, it, that belong to our Latin culture. Um, so I think it has, and it had romance and love, which is same things that I'm, I'm writing now, only I know a little more. Yeah. And, and so what did your parents do for a living? Uh, my parents had nothing to do with this industry. My father was an accountant, uh, but he taught me how to play chess. Mm. And I think it's very important to develop brain. And he, he, would, he wrote short stories and poems. And so we share that love for literature. He used to read a lot. And my mother is a therapist. So I learned a lot with, mm -hmm. from her about characters and you know, personalities. Yeah. And so how would you describe your home life and like Buenos Aires while you were growing up? What was it like? I grew up with a lot of green in our, uh, we had a garden in my house and I, I had, I remember having a lot of animals. Um, and, you know, we had dogs, we had chicken, we had rabbits, we had birds, we had fishes. Uh, we went to the different uh, type of animals and I remember being loved by my parents and, and encouraged to that anything I wanted could be possible yeah and did you have like a big family siblings like what was that situation like I had one brother that I love who's now a very successful producer in Mexico <laughs> um, it's funny how we both in the same industry and I used to dress him up. I, I say that he was my first actor. I used to dress him up and kind of boss him around mm -hmm. uh, because I'm also a director. So I, but he was very cooperative and creative as well. So I remember building houses with him and plays. Um, so it's, it's a, I have a great brother. And yes, then I have a big family of different cousins and aunts. Um, I've never been to Buenos Aires. How would you describe it, you know, especially when you were growing up? Uh, Buenos Aires is a, is a really a city that is very alive. Uh, it's a mix of Latin America and Europe. There's a lot of Italians. I'm part Italian. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very loud. People like to go to dinner late and stay up late. Um, People are very passionate and people are very funny. So I think I'm bringing all that into my uh, writing. Great. Um, and, and, and when you were going to school is, um, you know, like grade school or high school or the version of that in Argentina, I'm sure they call it different things. Um, were you, you know, like, were you a, a, a writer then even? Were you, is that something you excelled at? Um, yeah, so I really like literature, and then what I did after, you know, high school there is kind of like starts early, 
and ends kind of either at midday or mid afternoon. So mm -hmm. I used to do a lot of extracurricular activities in mm -hmm. the art. I used to do ballet. I used to do literature classes. I used to do acting. I used to do painting. So I think all that helped me um, create a better art right now because I have a sense of, of different type of art. I didn't know what exactly I wanted to be in school, uh, but I knew I liked the arts. Mm -hmm. and, and were your parents, you know, supportive of that? Yeah, yeah, I had, you know, it was that my parents were kind of hippie, so there was a time where there was, a, there was a, how can I say that? At that time, it was allowed for people, for kids to explore. It was mm -hmm. a time where, where uh, it, it was in psychology, and my mom is a psychologist, to let mm -hmm. kids express themselves. So I was lucky to have that and we also travel a lot and we went to a lot of museums my parents like art too so i was very lucky to have that background mm -hmm. and and what do you know about your, like your grandparents stories um you know how like do you know about your roots in argentina you said you also mentioned that you're part italian yeah i love uh my grandparents story uh my grandparents uh, great grandparents were from Italy to Argentina. They used to go to either Buenos Aires or New York, uh, but they didn't go to Buenos Aires. They went to uh, a, a state, kind of like Arkansas, Texas, like mm -hmm. further away from the big city. And my grandfather was a politician, mm -hmm. and he knew, uh, like my dad, about economy. And uh, he was in the government of Peron. You know, like Evita Peron, the Madonna mm -hmm. movie? Yeah. Well, I have a photo of my grandfather with Peron, that's for real. Cool. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. And then my grandmother, I love her story. This is my father's parents, who are mm -hmm. Um My grandmother was the first female pianist in an all-men orchestra. Mm -hmm. So when I think of her, I think that we have some similarities because she was in the arts with music, but she was in a mainly man-dominated world. Mm -hmm. And also music has a lot of mathematics. And I, I wear this ring because the one, the one I'm wearing now, because it used to be my grandmother's diamond. So from all the grandchildren, uh, my father was able to obtain it and I... Uh, my ex-husband designed a ring for me, but I'm carrying mm. my mother's diamond, who she's now dead, to think about her strength. Mm. It takes me, uh, you know, because at the time it's probably very, very difficult to be a woman in a in an all man orchestra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's funny, I, you know, there's still conversations about that in orchestras now, even how there aren't as many women, and yeah, it's interesting how things how much things have changed but how similar they stay you know yes and then my mother's uh grandparents my grandfather died when my mom was 11 years old so i never met him mm -hmm. but he was an engineer and he had a winery mm -hmm. uh and so my grandmother i was very close to and I wrote a novel with her as a as a protagonist. So, you know, you're you seem like you came from a very like culturally aware, creative family, you know. Um, and after you sort of left high school, like what did you do after that? Uh, so I my BA is in film directing. I, mm -hmm. I studied that in Argentina. Mm -hmm. um, it, there weren't that many film school at the time especially in Argentina. Um, but then I knew this is what I wanted to do. So there was a right decision to come to Los Angeles and to be in Hollywood where, you know, most of the cinema of the world is being made. So mm -hmm. I came here to get my master's degree at AFI. Hmm. And what what is the thing that drove you initially to, you know, to be like, oh, this is something I'm going to get my BA in, you know? Uh, well, 
I thought at, at 11 years old, when I like all these different type of arts, I mm -hmm. like music, I like painting, I like taking photos, I like, I didn't, I couldn't decide. And then I realized film writing and film directing kind of composes everything. So mm -hmm. that's when I realized I wanted to be a filmmaker. Um, and I told my mom, and I wrote this down too, and my mother, like, you know, I was 11. I was, like, super short. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I knew what I wanted to do back then. Yeah. And, and what you know, you getting your BA and, you know, directing, what, like, what did the classrooms look like? Like, were you, were there other women in the classes or... There were obviously more men than women, but there were some women too in the classes. And then I came here for AFI, and I think AFI has some somewhat 50-50. Mm. Um, it's very, uh, I think it's very balanced. I, mm. I, I went to, um, I was selected by Sundance and Women in Film uh for this program for for a, a woman's incentive program that they have and what mm. they say that in the united states is 50 50 men and women that go to school the problem is not school is after yeah it's 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 just culturally more acceptable for the men to pursue their careers and then women you know have to like take care of the home they have to take care of kids so they have to sort of take a step back and they normally would have if uh yeah that might be one reason but i think it's, there's more reasons than that i think mm. that the uh is being proven that there's more uh, male executives than women mm -hmm. so that's yeah. what can get the higher most and also another thing that it was very interesting that they told us in this sundance women in film uh incentive is that women sometimes are afraid to ask for money, mm. you know, for a job that requires that they pay them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because you're, you're right, you know, you, if you graduate, you have the right degree, you come out of it into the workforce, and it's like, who's hiring, you know? That makes a big difference in the, the next step after school. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I didn't say this. They they told us that mm -hmm. in the in the, based on statistics. So yeah. just repeating the statistics, and yeah. I believe the statistics to be true. Yeah. Um, and I think it's very very interesting. Mm -hmm. So what you know you you said after you got your BA that you moved to Los Angeles to to AFI to get your master's. Yeah, um, my master's is in screenwriting. And, and what, first of all, what prompted you to get your master's in screenwriting? Um, I feel like I, it was, it would be a good way to know, like learn English and, you know, write in English. Mm -hmm. And also I feel like when I finish school, which is what happens at AFI, they have you do two feature screenplays. Mm. Uh, so what happens is at the end, actually three, uh, three feature screenplays. So what happened at the end is I felt, okay, when the school ends, I would have three feature screenplays to shop. Mm -hmm. Smart. <laughs> so that, that was the, yeah, but the screenplays you write in school, they were not, they weren't that good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so you know, make the decision to move to the United States, to Los Angeles, is a big one, you know? Were you nervous about that? Like, what was that process like? Well, I was 22, 23 years old, so I wasn't, I wasn't too afraid of anything. Yeah. To be honest, I, I thought it was exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was, I, I was eager to learn. And what, what what was the decision behind? At the oh, beginning, yeah. yeah, I miss my friends when I when I moved. To be honest, and the first three months were very difficult. But then I went back to Argentina, visited my friends, and I realized they have moved on too, and they have other mm -hmm. jobs and other friends, um, and that I needed to follow my dreams. 
that's the reason to come here was to follow my dreams because I, you know, this is like the number one place to make movies mm -hmm. in the world. So let's talk about, you know, that initial move here. Was there like a culture shock? Like what's the difference between, you know, home and then L.A. at the time? Yeah, it was a it was a cultural shock for many things. The food, the way people talk to each other, um, you know, all the different choices that are here. That maybe Argentina is like less choices. You know, uh, for example, you I don't know. You go to a restaurant here and they ask you, "Do you want mayonnaise? Do you want ketchup? Do you want this? Mm -hmm. Do you want?" A hot sauce. You want like there's so many options. Even in the supermarket, there's less options there. And mm -hmm. I remember that being one of the cultural shocks. That was kind of funny. Yeah. Um, and did you did you speak English? Did you know English? Had you studied it before? Yeah. Uh, so I spoke English. I had English in school, but mm -hmm. also when I was 17 years old. I came to the United States for two months to learn English, one month in a school in Vermont mm -hmm. where we had classes all day. And then one month I lived with a family in Little Rock, Arkansas. Okay. <laughs> and trust me, there it was like, you speak English, you die. <laughs> so <laughs> there's not that many people speaking Spanish. That family was wonderful. There was yeah. a girl named Jane that we still friends. So that was mainly uh, the, the way that I started to learn English. Yeah, and so, you know, I'm, I'm an immigrant. I'm from Mexico City. Um, so I, wanna, I wanted to sort of get your experience. You know, you're an immigrant coming to the United States. Um, like, can you sort of talk about, like, your experience as an immigrant when you're living here? Like, things that you didn't expect or... Or even just like, you know, because I'm sure it was just more different kinds of people also. Yeah, yeah. The, the, and, and the thing about AFI is there wasn't just, there was a lot of immigrants there. So mm -hmm. it was really nice to have that community. You know, there was people from Europe, there was people from Asia, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of people going to AFI. Uh, that, was a, that was nice to have that group. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, it's, there's so many things from driving is different, you know, supermarkets are different, things that you, you take for granted. Um, of course, language is a problem because I have an accent and I had a bigger, more thick accent then. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people would understand you. That was that was really hard. And even now I write in English, but I always have to have someone correct the grammar because my grammar... It's terrible, you know, yeah. it's not this language. So I had to put an extra effort. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, what was it like coming from, you know, Argentina where, you know, mostly everyone's like you and then coming to the United States, did you ever feel like you were other or, you know? Well, you know, there's a big Latin community here. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I first moved here, I moved to Los Feliz, where AFI is. So mm -hmm. there was there was there was Echo Park around there, and I felt like there was a big community, especially from Mexico immigrating uh, to LA. So it, it wasn't like when I went to Arkansas that, <laughs> it was like that there was no people that looked like me then there at the time. Um, but but yeah, it's, 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 it's hard. It's hard. You have to readapt. I think it's really good for the brain, though. It's mm. really good for the brain to move to another country and learn another language and have a challenge to, to, the, to grow. Yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about, you know, after you graduated from AFI, you know, what did you do then? So after I graduated from AFI... Uh, my first job was in CNN Entertainment Spanish. Mm -hmm. So I worked there for uh, six to eight months uh, writing about anyone from Ricky Martin to Jennifer Lopez, anyone who was in the entertainment industry. We would uh, read the news at uh, 6 a.m. in the morning, report the entertainment news, and then do one or two pieces about uh, a person. 
a day. And I learned a lot. I learned how to write. I learned about editing. Um, and, you know, now I, I've, I've been interviewed twice by them with my new movie. So that was, that was great. I just felt like I was writing about other people that were creating and that I wasn't creating. Uh, so I was, mm. so I started writing my, a feature screenplay on weekends and at night. Uh, when I wasn't working and then I submitted that screenplay into the Nichols Fellowship which is the Academy Awards the Oscars um, screenwriting competition for newcomers mm -hmm. and I was finally there uh, so I received a letter with the little Oscar engraved in gold and mm -hmm. with that letter I raised the money to make my first independent feature cool and and, you know, I assume that when you were here for school, you were on a student visa, right? Yes. So I was in student visa. They give you a year of working visa. With that, I got the, uh, the job at, at CNN. At, and then I, I got a O-1 visa, like I extended for a working visa. Then after you have that for, I don't remember now, three years, uh, I had to renew it for another three years. Then I renew it for another three years. Then I got a green card. And then after 10 years of having the green card, I got uh, the citizenship and the passport. Mm -hmm. So now I'm an American. Great. Um, and, uh, I, and, you know, you mentioned that you still visit during the holidays. How often do you get back to Argentina? I, I speak to my mother and my brother every Sunday. For half an hour, for an hour. We also have a WhatsApp group and that we send each other pictures during the week. Let's, you know, let's move into, you know, your, your, your work, your working career, you know? How did that get started? You said that you used that money to fund your first film. So, you know, can you talk about that process after that? Okay. Yeah, my first mo my first movie, I didn't have any money. What I had is a letter from the Nichols Fellowship. Um, and the letter had the Oscar engraved it. It gave the screenplay a certain prestige. Mm -hmm. And I put together a $200,000 uh, budget. And then I went and raised the money with that letter. And uh, luckily, um, I found two amazing investors who believed in me and uh, gave me the money. And of course there was a lot of favors. Some people, uh, the crew was not working for free, but they were getting paid like, I don't know, very little. Mm -hmm. um, the, then the lab we got for free and the cameras and other things we got for free. So that was a sci-fi comedy. Uh, so it's low budget sci-fi mm -hmm. comedy. So with that that movie opened a lot of doors for me because it it went to a lot of festivals. I, I traveled the world with that film, so that was amazing. And then after that, what happened is a producer called me and said, "I read one of your scripts, and I would like you to uh, I would like to produce it." And then he said. And he had a the president of Sony and Disney Mexico and that he would like me to meet him. So I traveled to Mexico City with my 35 millimeter print, which was very, very heavy, walking through all the airport <laughs> without a card. And I met this man who's still there. His name is Philip Alexander. He's now become one of my best friends. And we watched my movie together. And he said, well, look, I don't know about that script, but we're making this movie called Ladies Night, which is the first Disney fictional movie in Mexico ever. And we were looking for a director here and we couldn't find the right person. And it's about two women. Would you like to read it? And I read it and I loved it. And I put together a presentation and basically I got the job and I moved to Mexico. Cool. And I made this movie Ladies Night and um, you know, it was kind of distributed by Buena Vista, so it was uh, about two women 
action comedy and uh that movie became the number one movie in the box office in mexico all year wow. uh in 2004 uh, i have even an article of a variety that says the number of movies in each country and ladies night was the number one uh movie uh so obviously after that i came back to the states it opened a lot of doors i did a movie for um VH1 that had music that was executive produced by Madonna. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after that, I directed, I wrote and directed a movie uh, called Sin Hombres Without Men uh, that had starring Eva Longoria, Kay del Castillo, uh, Christian Slater. Um, and it was that Without Men was sold in like 30 countries. It was done in this kind of sales company way but it was independently financed mm. and it was based on a novel uh i so saw that the producer uh, producer from new york hired me to adapt the novel and direct the movie and then after that one of those same producers told me asked me if i want to direct the thriller because i've never done a thriller so i directed the movie border run starring sharon stone financed by voltage and stars mm -hmm. um, then after that um i did i went back to mexico i had developed this script with the producer for a long time since i did ladies night and finally the script was ready and that movie uh when it in october uh also was a number of movie in the box office in mexico city in all mexico the country mm -hmm. um and then my last movie on Netflix. Um, so my last movie is called Despite, and it was done in, in Madrid, in Spain. I've never done a movie in Spain, so the humor was different. Um, but I'm very proud of that movie, and that's how it came out in Netflix a month ago. Perfect. And yeah, so you know, I, it sounds like you know Mexico has been good to you, um, and you've yeah. done a lot of great work with them. Uh, do you, do you have do you have like a dream to like make an Argentinian film like to like do something with 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 your home country? Yes, I, I think Argentina has amazing locations, amazing crews. Because when I worked, I worked there as a PA when I was in school, mm -hmm. just starting out. The crews are generations and generations of grandfathers and fathers that are very fast they used to work with american crews or international crews uh the problem right now is that argentina has no tax incentives uh -huh. so mexico has 25 colombia has 40 everybody's competing and they have they have to pass this law i know the law is there but they have to pass it in order for an investor to be interesting to go there because they have everything they have amazing location they have mountains they have snow they have beach they have everything mm -hmm. um so I would like that, but I, right now, financially, I just have to be able to explain to investors a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, with your writing, what, is the, what, what are the themes you like to tackle? Um, do you feel like, you know, you're always telling the same story different ways? Like, what's the stuff that attracts you and that you, makes you passionate about writing? Yeah, I think I, now that I've I've directed seven movies and I done I wrote other screenplays as well. I feel like everything I write is about tolerance, mm. um, and by that I mean tolerance for someone else if it's a love story, or tolerance for another race, or tolerance if you're a man for a woman, or tolerance if you're a woman for a man, and the understanding that perfectionism doesn't exist. Um, so I, I, I see a pattern now in all the stories that I respond to also the screenplays that people send me to direct. I find that I'm more drawn to those who have stories that speaks to me. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, with your latest film, you know, you mentioned it's on Netflix. So is what well, has been your experience with that as opposed to like the other ways your films have been like distributed uh working with netflix was great they they're very film and friendly they move really fast and the notes were great um and i i think my executives were great maybe i was lucky uh mm -hmm. 
and the team, you know, it came from an independent producer who had an actress, Blanca Suarez, who is in Cable Girls, and I really like her, and then the producers of Cable Girls. And so I like the producers, and I like the actress, and then I went to, and I like the challenge of working in Spain because I have seen, I had big influence from Pedro Almodovar mm -hmm. to other amazing filmmakers there. So I went there and then we put together an amazing cast. Uh, I knew Carlos Bardem, who's Javier's brother, and I called him up and then they knew, I have seen Rosie de Palma in a lot of Almodovar's movies. Is that actress that has the yeah. interest so I was a, it was a, an honor for me to work with her and yeah. Marisa Paredes who's an older famous Spanish actress and then the young generation to Belen Cuesta, Macarena Garcia, Amaya Salamanca so we had a, an amazing cast in this movie and it's kind of like a comedy about four sisters who go to their mother's funeral and their father is not their father so mm -hmm. they have to find out who the father um that's why it's called despite everything because it's in spain that says despite everything we're sisters yeah uh, so that's why we put that title because it's a common phrase yeah yeah and yeah that's really cool that you know your directing has sort of allowed you to work in you know different countries and and also like different because i'm sure the spanish is different in all three countries from where you're from even from the united states so it's it's an interesting yeah. couple of worlds so i did want to ask about you know uh, you're, you're a director so how i just wanted to know like what your your experience what of it was to like be at the helm of the, of these films and and be working in different countries with like different crews and you know sort of having it to like build this thing from the ground up yourself a few times. So what was that experience like? Uh, I like a challenge. So that's why I like to, I didn't know much. Then I started meeting with the agents and the actors and understanding the culture and everything and going to Madrid everywhere and everything because I came from an outsider looking in. And so I saw everything as new and exciting. What have you, you know, as in your writing and... Is there stuff that you're that you're sort of looking to write about? Is there like are there any ideas you have that like or things you see that you're like, oh, why hasn't anybody written about this? Why hasn't this been told yet? You know. So, so I have mm -hmm. a lot of different stories since my first movie was a sci-fi, uh, but I do sci-fi in a different way with comedy, mm -hmm. uh, kind of like the tone of Guardians of Galaxy or the Fifth Element. Mm -hmm. It's like. That. And so I have these screenplays, and again, because they're very expensive, I have to see, you know, how I'm going to get the finance to get them made, because I haven't done a big sci-fi movie. So it's, again, it's a challenge, but I like, I like challenging, and my, uh, my, my agent told me to write a novel about the sci-fi project because then maybe it would be easier to reverse engineer it and have mm -hmm. a novel. So I've actually just finished the novel of the sci-fi and um, somebody's taking a look, correcting the grammar and then um, and then we'll see if any publisher wants to publish it or maybe it will help get the movie made. Mm -hmm. And And... And how do you see, you know, the industry now where, you know, you've had a lot of success with, you know, um, with like Spanish language films, films in other countries based in other countries. Like, what do you really see that the U.S. is not doing or, or missing out on? Is there anything that you would change and, and just in the way it's structured? And I think sometimes the uh international projects the characters are more flooded and have you know they're not so perfect and mm. they have more depth but right now i feel like tv is helping with that because in tv you see a lot of you have more time to develop the characters and you see a lot of flooded characters so i think it's helping raise the level of movies as well mm. do you have like any 
you know, aspirations or like interest in television? Um, yes, I just, I wrote a, a, a TV series, uh, uh, but at the end we lost, we lost the rights, so it's not going to get made, but I had the opportunity to write the pilot and the series Bible. And that was last year. And this year in March, I directed three episodes of a TV series in Mexico called Claramente for Claro Video. So mm. I, I now have written and directed television. You know, so I have to still get into television here because those projects were for Mexico. Mm -hmm. So I, I did want to ask about, you know, people that you admire, um, writers, they could be Latinx or not. And just, you know, people that you see whose work you admire, either heroes of yours or people you see working in your field, peers of yours, stuff that you're passionate about that you're seeing out there. Yeah. Well, as a director, I'm, I'm a fan of Guillermo del Toro, Tim Burton. I admire Almodovar. Um, so I like the directors that are very visual and mm -hmm. that they have a different type of voice. Um, and I also like writing, I like literature and I look, I like a lot of the Latin literature. I, I like Julio Cortazar and just, I grew up reading magical realism more than American writers, although there's some American writers that are amazing, of course. Um, but my influences I feel has to do with more visual, um, uh, writers and directors mm. yeah yeah and that's something that's come up with a couple of the writers i've interviewed just the sort of magical realism that we sort of tend to have in our stories that is sort of unique to our stories yeah and i like, love i would love to do a magical realism movie or a fantasy movie i haven't done that now that disney is coming out with disney plus i'm hoping to have the opportunity and i went to an interview that I'm still waiting to hear for, for, for a Disney movie that has magical elements. So, you know, maybe they don't do magical realism here in the States, but they do fantasy, mm -hmm. you know, they call it fantasy. They yeah. call it, you know, that's why I like sci-fi, I think, because sci-fi in a way it is something that it doesn't exist and that is visual. It is based on science and, but it is magical in a way. And so I'm very, very drawn to that. And in fact, I think the magical elements is in our writing, like you said, because even when I try to write something grounded, I, it always comes up a little not grounded, you know, because our lives, because we grew up uh, kind of with that background, uh, that influences our writing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's very... I don't know. It's it's so innate in our culture. So it's interesting that, that I think it's definitely something that's been lacking in just the general culture. Um, and you know, you you know, your your I think what's interesting about your story is that your sort of work and process and the in, how you've been successful in, in this industry is very much based in like Latin America and 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 you know. I think that's just interesting in the fact that it's it doesn't seem to be very like American based and it's thinking and the process it feels like like very like unique to the place it's from. And and I I so I just wanted to know like how do you feel about your like your identity here in the US and the projects that you that are you're able to get made here and and maybe perhaps filmed here, like, like, is that something you think about? Yeah, I think about that all the time. I think that I'm not from here, I'm not from there. Yeah. And so what I, I, you know, where is home? Or who are you? Because I'm not, you know, I left, I left my country when I was very young. Mm -hmm. So what I think that that does is, if I make a movie in Mexico or when I make a movie in Mexico, people tell me that it moves really fast, right? Because I have the American sensibility mm -hmm. of having the edit go faster and have more music than 
you know, these characteristics that are American, I can bring to a Latin American film mm. and vice versa. When I make a film in English, uh, I bring, you know, even though it's in English, I bring colors and I bring mm -hmm. passion and romantic stories. And, you know, I could do w some weird things with the camera that maybe it, that we don't belong to a grounded American story. So mm -hmm. I think uh, whatever I do, of course, I have to be who I am as an artist, and I bring to Latin America, if it's a Latin film, some American characteristics, and if it's an American film, I can bring some Latin characteristics to it. Yeah, 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 that's an interesting point, you know, to think of that. Since you are of both worlds, that they would sort of influence one another. And yeah. And it's funny that pe pe people would notice it too, you know, because it's so unusual from what they're used to seeing based on the stuff that's coming out of that country. Um, yeah. It's interesting. And do you have any other family here? No. So I can't talk about the other family here because I don't know. But I'm very close to my family no matter yeah. where they are. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that makes sense why you would call them, like, every week, you know? You, because I'm sure you miss them, and and you, it's yeah. So, can you speak to that experience of just also, you know, do you know? Do you, are there any other like Argentinian, you know, writers or directors that you know of that are here that you're friends with? No, I I actually have more Mexican friends here than Argentinians because there's more a bigger Mexican community in yeah. Los Angeles. Argentinians usually move to Miami or New York is closer. Mm -hmm. um, so I know there are some Argentinian here. I just don't have the, mm -hmm. as many friends that are Argentinian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, well, maybe with this podcast more, then we'll reach out to you. Um, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. And, and so I, I did also want to ask about, you know, your writing in the sense of, of like what you feel like you bring into it, your identity, what that, what you try to put into it, that maybe is just unique to you or where you're from. Well, I'm. I try not to do movies about revenge. Mm -hmm. uh, some might have action, but I try not to do too much violence, gratuity violence. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm very aware of the message of the movie gives. Mm -hmm. That's very important to me when I read a screenplay that is not mine or when I write, what am I saying? And the responsibility of that is very important to me. Um, so that's, that's what I bring. Um, I also, look, I think that I bring colors. I bring part of my culture is colors and romance and feminine, you know, subjects or dialogues. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I haven't, I don't think I ever do a horror film. I, I don't like them. They just sent me the other day a horror thriller that I kind of like because it has comedy. So maybe that would be different, mm -hmm. yeah. but you know, you, you bring who you are, whether you like it or not for good or for bad It's it's impossible not to bring who you are to a creative process. Yeah, and you know, just looking at your work, it's you've definitely you definitely do more female fronted, you know, um, films characters. Is has that been like a conscious decision of yours, or is that just sort of how it's worked out? I well, I'm very good directing women, but so I am uh, directing men. But I like, of course, I can speak about women uh, a lot better because it's who I am. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I ask every, every person on the podcast to help title their episode, um, you know, sort of to like, talk about who they are, you know, the prompt is a blank Latinx writer. So in that blank, you can sort of just put in anything you want, it can be more than one word, you can mix it around, but just anything that maybe speaks to your writing, to your journey, just the conversation, so that because I want this to be a podcast where people can, you know, connect and identify and see themselves through another writer. I think funny or fun will be that if I had to pick one adjective, use mm -hmm. it, a fun or fun Latinx writer or yeah. a witty 
Latinx writer. I if I would pick one of those three. Yes. Yeah, and and I think that describes you know sort of the stuff you have worked on. Um, and yeah. and where does that come from? Like how how why is that like the thing you sort of gravitate towards? I don't know. I've just I always had humor. I like humor. And you know, if you if you were talking to like somebody that was like you, that was like maybe from Argentina, and they're like trying to pursue writing or director, like what is some advice you would give them? If you want to write, write if and read. And if you want to direct, just direct from yeah. yourself. Edit in your computer. I just the more you do it, the better you get at it. I wrote so many screenplays that had gone nowhere, and even Guillermo del Toro said he had seventeen unproduced screenplays. Mm. I have a, I have a bunch of them too. Some never get made, and I think part of the success is to have more product too, so they ha you have more possibilities mm. of winning, right? Yeah, that's good advice. You know, if you want to do it, do it. Yeah. Uh, and I did see that you, 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 you know, you've been involved a little bit with uh, Nalip. Yes. So, so it, I, what has been your experience with them? Because I always say, like, anybody that's like hustling is so, in some way involved with them. So I just wanted to know what your experience was. Yeah, I'm. I'm very involved with Nalip. I'm a big friend of Ben Lopez, the director, since he started, because he started, like I started, we both started from below. And um, I'm going to speak in two panels in Nalip. Mm -hmm. uh, one is a pitching panel and the other is a directing panel. And I very much like that community. As Latinos, we don't have another place where we could all unite and mingle and network and also not only network, with Latinos, but with other people, because Nalip uh, lets anybody in, you know, mm -hmm. and so you can meet people that are speaking at panels uh, or at the gala party. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's an amazing summit. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's also an important point because it's yeah. important for us to talk to each other. It's important for us to collaborate, but it's also important that outsiders are also in the conversation even just to listen to know what the problems are to know what, what we're having issues with to know like what's out there and what people are working on is helpful absolutely i totally agree uh thank you so much for coming on i appreciate your time i appreciate everything it was great to like talk to you about your experience and all the work you're doing everybody check out your new film on netflix yeah despite everything and where can people find you your social media just if they want to reach out um, well, despite everything, is on Netflix in 190 countries, so they can see it from anywhere in the world and in 19 languages. And then my social media, Instagram, because Facebook is already full, is uh, G-A-B-B-O and my last name, Tagliavini. Uh, so right. Gabo, the two Bs, and my last name, T-A-G-L-I-A, -A V as in Victor, I and I. All right, perfect. So now people know where to find you. Argentinians, hit you up. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you, Ruben. Okay, okay have a good day. Thank you.